Good morning. On behalf of the Academy of Political Science and its journal, Political Science Quarterly, I welcome you to today's forum. My name is Marilyn Amantas. I am Associate and Managing Editor of Political Science Quarterly and a lecturer in the Department of Government at Sacred Heart University. This event is one of a series um, launched by the Academy of Political Science to spotlight prominent and timely PSQ articles. Today, we feature an article that published in the fall 2022 issue of Political Science Quarterly entitled, Assessing Futures Intelligence, Looking Back on Global Trends 2025. We have with us the authors of the article, James Wirtz and Roger George. Dr. Wirtz has served as a professor, department chairman, and dean at the Naval Postgraduate School. There, he played a pivotal role in creating the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. He has written extensively on national security and intelligence affairs. Welcome, Dr. Wartz. Dr. George had a 30-year career as a political analyst at the CIA, where he also served as a national intelligence officer, as well as a policy planner in the departments of state and defense. He has taught intelligence and national security at the National War College, Georgetown University, and Occidental College. With us also is Gregory Treverton, who will serve as our discussant. Dr. Treverton is a senior advisor with the Transnational Threats Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's also a professor of the practice of international relations and special science, spatial sciences at the University of Southern California. Finally, I introduced the moderator of today's event, Professor uh, Robert Shapiro. He is president of the Academy of Political Science and editor of Political Science Quarterly and a professor of political science at Columbia University. Welcome all. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Our um, attendees are eager for our forum to begin. Um, and with that, Professor Shapiro. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Elena. And I'd like to thank Jim, Roger, and Greg for, participa for participating in this, and also Jim and Roger for, for writing this excellent article for Political Science Quarterly. And I also want to thank Lauren Morales Kando, who's the Executive Vice President of, uh, of the Academy of Political Science and is also operating here behind the scenes and is, has set up this uh, nice production for us. Um, very excited about this topic, this topic of, of, of prediction. And I'm, I'm reminded of the famous quote by that famous philosopher, Yogi Berra, who uh, said, it's difficult to predict, especially about the future. And all you baseball fans out there uh, can see how difficult it is to predict because a lot of the, uh, the, the best um, baseball teams in terms of season record did, did either did not make it through the playoffs or, and playoffs or, or got, not, got knocked, off, knocked off early, including the Yankees here in, in New York. That a lot of us are, are lamenting about. And, and with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Jim to begin the discussion of the article. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Marilena. Thanks uh, through the Academy inviting us to talk about our article, Assessing Futures Intelligence, Looking Back on Global Trends 2025. Well, you know, I've been a consumer of the pro this National Intelligence Council product uh, for many years. I recommend it to a lot of people within DOD uh, because, you know, for strategic planning purposes, you've got to have some sort of concept of what the future 10, 15, 20 years down the road will be. And I thought the uh, Nick did an outstanding job when it came to predicting and using and estimating long-term trends and how they were shaping our future. Uh, but the futures intelligence is not a subject that's attracted much attention within political science. I was surprised to learn there's, there seems to be a, a community of futurologists out there. But I don't I don't know. It's a strange group, I think, of sort of science fiction writers and statisticians uh, and people who were trying to develop this sort of nascent discipline of future studies. But what really motivated me uh, to write the article was the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you will all remember back, there was this sort of outburst of outrage about another intelligence failure when it came time uh, to uh, estimate this occurrence of a global pandemic. And, you know, I, I thought about that. And I said, that is just simply not true. For decades, the, you know, the IC, strategic studies community, uh, the home, even homeland security and public health community has been warning about the, the onset of a global pandemic uh, 
And then I thought back and said, you know, they even called it pr pretty closely. And when you went back and looked at uh, Global Trends 25, written in 2008, uh, there was a very interesting uh, prediction about a SARS-like virus emerging from China. So when, with, with that thought in mind, I contacted my uh, dear and longtime friend, Roger George, uh, with an outline for the paper saying, hey, what do you think? Do you think this is worth doing? And luckily for me, Roger uh, signed on to the project. And as I say, the rest is history. So <laughs> next slide, please. So what is futures intelligence? Um, I'm sure many readers of um, PSQ are very well educated about national security subjects. But unless you've been in the field of intelligence for a long time, you may not be as familiar with futures intelligence. And one way to characterize it is to first talk about what is the normal intelligence assessment like? Well, as we all know, it's classified. Um, you need a clearance to write it. You need a clearance to read it. Um, we use multiple sources. Many are highly classified. Uh, we do not share this with anyone outside the US government with a few exceptions with our closest allies like the Five Eyes Intelligence Group. There tends to be a focus on current analysis where we have a lot of sources that can corroborate trends that we're seeing. Um, and these are forecasts that are largely tailored around what the current set of policymakers need to do and decisions they need to make. So how is futures intelligence different? Well, first thing is it's unclassified. It relies only on open sources. It's not coordinated throughout the uh, US intelligence community the way that a presidential daily brief might be or other um, national estimates um, to reflect the official views of the US intelligence community. It's very long-term, 10 to 15 years in the case of the global trends um, types of uh, work. And it's highly speculative. And why is it highly speculative? Because we really have no quote unquote raw intelligence looking 10 to 15 years out with a few exceptions. Um, so it can be shared with others. And in the course of this production of a global trends document, uh, the National Intelligence Council and the Strategic Futures Group will share this with a lot of outside experts on a whole range of topics. It will organize conferences. Um, it will do a number of things to get very different perspectives on what the future might look 10 to 15 years out. So it's quite different. Um, and it's all, all focused on giving policymakers who are coming into office every four years, typically a new president or a second term, a way to step back from the current focus on what's happening today to think about how are you going to shape today in a way that can help avoid or encourage positive trends 10 to 15 years out. So that's a summary of what futures intelligence is. The Global Trends 2025 document is the fourth in a series that began in the late 1990s. And um, try to imagine if you're um, a reader of the 2025 document, what was it like in 2008? This document was produced for the first Obama administration. And back in 2008, things were looking very different. Of course, we were in the middle of a pandemic or I'm sorry, a financial meltdown and other problems close to home. And this document was trying to get us out of the inbox and looking further down the road to 2020, 2025. So that's futures intelligence in a nutshell. So next slide. Well, <clears throat> why do we pick uh, Global Trends 2025? Well, you know, as about the fourth in the series of the, glo of the Global Trends estimates, Produced by the NIC, that we thought this is sort of beginning. Uh, 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 it came about as a format in terms of the methodology, the participants. This is sort of a mature example of uh, the futures intelligence produced by the NIC. Earlier examples were all a little bit more on the experimental side. I think one of the first ones was it actually took the form of a almost like a, a, a cartoon, almost like a uh, 
a little cartoon magazine. It was a, it was about globalization. I thought it was a brilliant piece of work, but this is this is not in the form of a picture book uh, or a comic book kind of format uh, to communicate the message. So this is basically the format that that is now going to be used in, in the ensuing uh, editions. The other reason we picked it is that 2025 is still hanging fire. And by that, mean, I mean, we're not at 2025 yet. And I think what happens to the earlier uh, Nick products, the, the predictions that come to pass, we, we look at it in hindsight and see it, oh, this is completely mundane. You know, of course, this is going to happen. How only a fool will not expect this. And the ones that are wrong, they, they actually look comical in appearance. It's only when they're pending that you could still have a feel or appreciate uh, the tension there between what is predicted and what is coming to pass and what could still come to pass. In, in fact, Roger and I, there are parts in our article that have already could be tweaked a little bit because of changes in the environment since we wrote it over the last maybe 18 months or so. So in that way, uh, who knows? who knows about 2025? We still have a couple of years to go. Uh, one of the other, like a critique of the article, though, was, well, why don't you survey all of the Global Futures uh, product and uh, then tell us uh, what, how well it, they're doing. The problem is, is the current edition doesn't come to pass till 2040. So it's an ongoing process. You're never going to get there. Uh, and by the time 2040 comes along, it'll be hopefully a 2060 prediction. So it, it never really comes to end that way. And the two predictions in here that I was, once again, most interested in, as I already mentioned, the pandemic prediction. Uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, really spot on. And then there's also a, a, a lingering peak oil prediction in this. And for those who aren't um, familiar with this, for many years, uh, the NIC and the CIA, or the IC broadly defined, uh, was hanging its hat on this uh, fear of peak oil. What peak oil meant is, would be there'd be still oil in the ground, but production could not match demand. Prices would skyrocket, the market would collapse, and you know we you know we'd be in, in, in big trouble. Well, in fact, the exact opposite has occurred. Uh, the U.S. had gone from energy um, uh, dependence to energy independence, uh, and what what happened and what clearly what what came to pass was the advent of fracking. Fracking actually changed. Uh, oil production for the United States and, and invalidated sort of the peak oil prediction. It was no longer a problem uh, coming to pass. We also had a surge in green technology that was not anticipated. So looking at those two things, why did they get it sort of right? Why did they go wrong is what sparked our interest in this um, global trends report. Next slide. So before I talk a little bit about our methodology, I, I want to put up um, a certain caveat. Um, Jim is more comfortable using the word prediction. I'm most comfortable using the word forecast because in futures intelligence, much of the work we're doing is not making a, a point prediction. We're trying to assess long-term trends where we're generally headed. And we're not going to be able to tell you 10 to 15 years from now at what date a certain kind of event with any granularity is going to occur. So I think it would be more correct to say there are a number of forecasts embedded in the 2025 document. Um, in fact, there, there are dozens and dozens of them. So how did we decide to look at the ones we examined in the article? Well, basically we read through this long document, which was quite expansive and they get longer every, every four years and tried to determine what were some of the major forecasts that you found throughout the document. And the 10 that we um, came up with are listed in this slide. And when we looked at those 10, we realized for the article of the length we're writing, we can't look at all 10. And in fact, if you look at the first four or five, they kind of come down to a power shift to Asia. China becomes a dominant player in the global arena, both economically, politically, and militarily. So we kind of selected that group as, as almost one. Then we looked at the issue of ide ideological competition. Remember in 2008, uh, Obama was just thinking about a reset with Russia. He was sitting down with Xi to talk about rules of the road. So this idea that there wouldn't be an ideological competition of the kind we experienced in the Cold War was very prevalent. 
And as Jim mentioned, there was the fossil fuel scarcity and the global pandemic forecast or scenario. So we selected from the 10 about four or five that we then went forward to examine in greater detail. And so in the next slide, uh, Jim will talk about some of those um, hypotheses that we developed. Okay, next slide. Next slide. And, and you know, Roger is absolutely correct about the difference between prediction and forecast. You know, I think I should have a sign. Prediction is done by fortune tellers. Forecast is done by the IC. So. Okay. I think we took, do we, I think we took every, do we take every, the word prediction completely out of the article, Roger? I tried. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, well, key hypotheses that we, um, we, we used in thinking about the, uh, the forecasts. Well, you know, we thought that analysts were sort of prone to certain cognitive or cultural biases. And the first is <clears throat> the cognitive biases. Uh, and we took this out of the futures literature is that there's a linear projection bias. Uh, if, there's a, if there is good hard data, and this is mostly demographic, economic, uh, you know, maybe you know, industrial, commercial, but if there's data, data involved, and those data seem to be stable and easily, and they're good metrics, there's a tendency to take those uh, projections out and use them to, to just to move out and project those onto the future, extrapolate and come up with an estimate of what the future might look like. Uh, the Ceres Paribus bias is that there's a tendency to uh, focus on one factor and hold all other factors constant. Um, you know, maybe at most you get two, but what this means is that the, the exquisite interaction of competing factors, uh, black swans, unanticipated events, it's very, very difficult for analysts uh, to begin to integrate more than one or two uh, considerations into any sort of forecast. So there's a tendency to hold other factors constant. constant. And the third is an arrival fallacy. And once you begin to think about it, you can see this in just about any, a lot of analysis done by political scientists is that what, what you assume is there's this motion of what the future will be like in 2025 and that we arrive and then things become sort of fixed and not and will not evolve uh, any longer. But the truth is, you know, history, time, society, government is always evolving, always moving forward. So in 2025, it's just a stepping stone to 2030 or 2035, the world is constantly changing. Uh, you know, there are examples of, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Fukuyama's end of history, you know, talks about the arrival of sort of the, the, ide the, the perfection of ideology, the perfection of political systems. But even if we got to that point, the, the, the train would still still not stop at that station, would continue to move on. So that's something that has that 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 could be affecting forecasts in uh, global futures work. Roger. On the strategic cultural biases, um, one of the things that is sort of a uh, written rule, <laughs> certainly a part of every intelligence analyst's um, internal um, guidance system is we don't do policy. And what that means is we are focused exclusively on the foreign environment, foreign actors, international trends. We are not looking at the United States as a target of our analysis. And that has been true since the days of uh, Sherman Kent, where we would keep you know, ourselves separate from the policy community so we could make objective analysis and not be part of the political debate directly. And what that has meant is that when we do futures analysis, we are excluding a huge part of the world, namely the United States. So that is a problem uh, potential, potentially for getting a good assessment of where the world is headed when the US is set aside uh, when considering these forecasts. I mean, the other part of this, and Jim and I have written a separate chapter in a book on strategic culture focused on the intelligence community. And that is um, a particular bias that I think Americans have about being optimistic, uh, seeing the positives. Remember in 2008, we still thought globalization was a positive thing for the world and for us. Uh, democratization was continuing. Um, and so I think there is an inherent bias on the part of even the typically skeptical U.S. intelligence analysts to see the glass half full 
rather than half empty. Um, and to be sure, because we live in a classified world, most US intelligence analysts, um, they have only been educated in an American style um, system, which has inculcated these positive American values about democracy, free market systems as the best system. So I think that is in the back of all of our minds as analysts, a, a bias that we have a hard time uh, protecting ourselves against. So those were the set of hypotheses that we were looking at when we examined some of these major forecasts that were made in the 2025 document. So next slide. Well, the first point is that, you know, the, 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 the Nick was sort of right on the money when, uh, uh, when they when they used when they projected ec using economic projections and hard data, I mean the demographic prediction uh, estimates the uh, the uh, forecasts relying on economic developments uh, generally played out the way uh, as they were as they were laid out. I think that in hindsight it might be a little more uh, the rise of China is a little more apparent than was forecast in the document, but it was in fact forecast. Uh, in the document. Roger? Yeah, and I think the the incorrect, if we can say that, or less accurate forecasts tend to rely uh, too much on some of these con so-called constant factors. I guess they, in the document itself, it might have called them major certainties, but it was not able to integrate some of the other factors that were less certain to come up with some different kinds of forecasts. Um, the one that um, sticks out the most for me is democratization. <clears throat> Here, I think you have a combination of um, the view that the economic progress that will be made in China and other parts of Asia is slowly um, going to help open up those systems uh, to become more like us rather than remain largely authoritarian. And I think that also reflected this cultural bias that a country like China or Russia are gonna be unable to prevent political liberalization as they open up in e economically. And that was sort of a, a, a idea embedded in this whole notion of democratic peace that with opening up of the economics, there would be political uh, liberalization to follow. Uh, and that's where I think in this one issue of, of what would be the fate of democracy in the 2025 document, they were overly optimistic. There are in fact in the document, and I'll, I wanna highlight this, some questions, some caveats that indicated there is uncertainty there. But I think as you read the whole document, you do not get the sense that there's going to be an ide ideological competition by 2025. And today we know there is. If you read any Biden speech on international affairs or China, he is characterizing this as authoritarianism versus democracy and democracy has to prevail. We have to do a better job of selling it. So I think certainly that was one of the forecasts that wasn't quite on the money for the reasons, um, the hypotheses that we had put forward in that previous slide. Next and then slide. just, you know, finally for the cultural bias, the cultural bias prevents analysts from deeply assessing U.S. factors, right? That yeah. you can't, you can't focus internally. Uh, it's not the IC's job is to monitor American businesses, American technology, American science. Uh, so if those developments come out of the American uh, s and sector, uh, it, it, it's oddly, uh, the IC is better equipped to uh, focus on foreign developments and less focused on American developments. Let, let me just add a point there. Um, I was involved on the margins of the Global Trends 2030. And that exercise included a trip to Silicon Valley by a number of us to hear from some of the technology leaders so I think there has been an effort on the part of the NIC to get deeper into the technology side of things, even the US component of that, but it is really difficult. We had just a couple of days in Silicon Valley 
um, to explore some of these issues of where is the internet headed, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, as we know, we've got biometric technology, we've got all sorts of subfields where technology is racing ahead. So it is extremely difficult to get your arms around the pace or the dynamism of technology for a forecast that's looking 10 to 15 years out. So implications for intelligence. Um, I think one of the implications, and this may be in the too hard category, um, most futures analysis relies on a fairly sim simple matrix, you know, varying two, two different issues at a time. So you get four boxes in that matrix. That's typically how scenarios analysis is, has been conducted when I've been involved with it. But it simply cannot capture the complexity of the international environment. It's a multivariate analysis that has to be conducted, but the human mind simply cannot conduct that. So we somehow have to get our arms around the problem of how do you build a process that can do more multivariate analysis uh, rather than be prone to this ceteris paribus problem of holding everything else constant while you look at economics or you look at political change or you look at you know, military power. Um, and that is a real challenge, I think, for the NIC and for other future intelligence work to figure out a way to get a more complex model together. The second point is obvious from what we've said so far. The U.S. factor has to be addressed more directly. And I think little by little, the NIC has, has dipped its toe deeper and deeper into that area. But I think we're going to have to go even further. I know we've tried to involve foreign experts and uh, political scientists in looking at the US, but most foreign experts are a little timid in making forecasts about the United States. Um, so it hasn't been entirely satisfactory. Um, but what I think we need to do at a minimum is create some other institutes or think tanks who can do some of this analysis of what's happening in the United States, particularly on the technology side, so we can get a more uh, rich or robust picture of just how fast technology and politics could change. Um, and I guess the last point should be also obvious. Futures intelligence work shouldn't just be practiced by the NIC and by the Strategic Futures Group. We should encourage it in other places so we get more perspectives on where this unknown future is headed. I know the British have conducted some of this um, themselves in the defense ministry, looking more at political military issues. Um, Singapore has done horizon scanning. So the methodologies are out there, but it probably would be great if we could encourage more groups to do their own. Um, so we had a multiplicity of perspectives to inform us about the future. So I think with that, we're open to questions uh, that might be out there. Okay, uh, th th thank you, Roger and, and Jim. Okay, before before I, I give Greg a chance to offer some comments, I just want to I just wanted to tell the audience, please submit your questions through the Q and A uh, facility in Zoom. We've got a couple of good questions already, and I hope to, to be able to cover additional ones as well. Greg, thanks very much. It's great to be here, and congratulations to uh, Jim and Roger on a, a what I think is a very fine article. Uh, I had the good fortune to be vice chair of the NIC in the 1990s when we were thinking up this idea of doing, I didn't get to do one then, but we were thinking up the idea. And uh, it turns out to be great that it's unclassified, has to be unclassified. In fact, if you're looking out more than a couple of years, all that classified stuff on your computer isn't much help. Uh, but being unclassified is also great because then, uh, and I, when I did get a chance to do one of the global trends and as chair of the NIC and 2017, we released it at the museum and had a day-long set of events. So I was enough of a Washingtonian to know if, if we'd said to our policy counterparts, we're going to give you a pretty long secret document about the future looking out 20 years, they would have said, thank you very much. We'll look forward to it. And they never would have opened it. The current would have driven out any attention to longer term. 
But I knew that if we got some press coverage, then they would turn to their special assistants and say, you know, what the devil is the Nick up to? Uh, and we'd get some attention that way. And I think that's worked out remarkably well. What I thought I'd do is just reflect a little bit, some do's and don'ts from my own experience of th trying to think about the future for an entire career, really. And I think these will reinforce some of the points that uh, Jim and Roger make. Uh, point one for me is uh, pay attention to the data. Uh, <clears throat> I was struck by this in my very, I guess my second job in government, I was on the National Security Council staff back in the Carter administration. And Murray Feshbach, him and the demographer, came back from a trip to Russia with disturbing numbers. It's things like male lifespan were going down in Russia, not up. Things were going in the wrong direction for a, a supposedly rich country. Uh, he, Murray was more of a tree than a forest person, so he didn't have a good explanation, and we couldn't help much. We fell back on easy explanations like, oh, the Russian men drink too much. But in retrospect, what he had seen was really the canary in the coal mine about a deeply sick society. So paying attention to the numbers, I think, is important. I got wrong at the beginning of the Ukraine, before the Ukraine war. I got it wrong and intelligence got it right because they were looking at the numbers. Uh, I thought, asked myself, did the worst of mirror imaging and said, uh, is there any reason why Vladimir Putin would want to um, invade Ukraine, couldn't think of any. So I looked at the buildup, the military buildup and said, this is entirely a show of force to try and get the attention of the United States and NATO to negotiate. Well, my colleagues, my former colleagues in intelligence got it right because they looked at the numbers and they said, these numbers are way too big in a military buildup to be just a show of force, he's gonna attack. So do one is uh, pay attention to the numbers. The second do is use some method. Um, when I was out of government, another think tank, not the Rand Corporation where I was, uh, looked around the intelligence agencies and asked, do they use methods in forecasting? Uh, the answer was doubly bad. One, mostly they didn't use any method. Uh, and to the extent they had a method, it was basically a bunch of people sitting around a table and brainstorming. Well, we know that's a bad way to think about the future. You're better off conduct, uh, consulting the experts separately and then somehow trying to combine their views. But if you put them together, that's just an invitation to groupthink uh, and uh, a bad way to think about the future. So uh, trying to use some method, I think, scenarios or something else uh, really uh, is important. Third of my, um, uh, this is here I think I underscore what they said, uh, try not to be too straight line and projecting. And we know that most of the time, the future is gonna be the default prediction. Uh, but trying to straight line thinking, I think is important. I, when I was chairing the national, uh, 2015 happened. So I looked at Global Trends 2015, which had been done in the late 1990s. Uh, and it was pretty good, uh, but there was a bit too much of straight line thinking. Um, it, it was still a pretty rosy view of the future. I had the same problem. I, I was writing a book on intelligence, which actually I did before 9-11, but came out after 9-11. When I got to the uh, last chapter, I realized that I too was uh, succumbing to a pretty rosy globalization uh, view of the future. So I asked myself in the last chapter, uh, what might knock that off? Uh, I came up with two possibilities, rocket science. One was a major terrorist attack on the United States. The other was a major global recession. Say neither was uh, exactly rocket science. And I didn't want to be two, to, two for two, but it was at least a, a realization that you had to try and think a little bit beyond. In any 20 year period, a recession is pretty likely. Finally, let me just to conclude with a reinforce the point that Jim and Roger make, which is about bias. Uh, I was struck when I was in my last time in government chairing the NIC, uh, I got interested in unconscious bias, those biases we carry around that we're not quite aware of. And one fascinating example came out of a conversation with one of the women who'd been on the team hunting, this, this was a CIA team hunting for uh, Osama bin Laden. And she said, um, we finally realized 
that one source of bias we had was we were all Americans, and that affected the way they thought about searching for Osama bin Laden. Uh, let me just conclude by, um, by supporting Roger's last point, and that is trying to take the states and the court of the United States is, is, is tricky politically, but it's really important. When you think of the future, in some ways, one of the biggest, maybe the biggest uncertainty about the future is the United States. What, what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to be engaged? Or are we going to go back to uh, America first? Those are really big questions that have enormous impact on the future. And uh, not being really have to be able to put those on the table, it seems to me, at, at least as hypotheses, if you're going to think seriously about the future. Again, thanks and congratulations to Roger and Jim. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, before I open the floor to questions, and I've got a, got a few good questions in, in the Q&A, Jim and, and Roger, do you want to respond to anything? Well, you know, I, I was just going to say it's the, you know, the uh, American optimism that's reflected on in this. You know, the, the issue is there's all these, you know, new technologies, new sort of social political developments that are, we're constantly, we're now really being constantly bombarded by these things. And, you know, one of the, what I thought was taken back by is that, you know, the mRNA technology was barely on the scientific horizon in 2008. Uh, but when this, we, by 2019, we had this technology, but what we lacked is the ability of society, politics to deal with it, right? So the, you know, the shot we got in our arms uh, was available in January of, of 2020, but we had to wait till February of 20, I guess, 21 to, to, to actually get the shot, right? Uh, if we could accelerate these things, if we could cope with these things, if these new changes don't create uh, some sort of uh, social political turmoil, uh, we'll be a lot better off. And that's that's an element I think is very difficult for the NIC to assess. Uh, how will these new technologies be integrated into American society and politics? Will we be good at coping at them as opposed to maybe the competition? I, I guess I have one comment um, to follow up on what Greg said about the American bias. Um, I was at a conference that the director of intelligence held after 911, and they invited some outside speakers, including one from Goldman Sachs. And one of the things the Goldman Sachs representative said is, well, at our financial risk uh, unit, uh, the analysts in that unit carry 60 different passports, 60. Mm -hmm. To understand financial markets in India, China, Europe, Latin America. And when I think about the American bias, it's we all carry the same passport. We've all been trained and educated in the same culture. So we tend to look at the world in a particular way, just to follow up what, what Greg was saying in his example. And the other anecdote is back in the early 1990s, when I was NIO for Europe, we wrote a paper on NATO, the future of NATOs. And one of the things we said, and this was as close to the line as we could get, we basically said NATO has a future as long as the U.S. remains engaged. Because we could not imagine a situation where the Europeans would run away from NATO. So the only scenario we could imagine is if the U.S. starts to pull back, then we think NATO will fall away. And I think <clears throat> we've seen evidence of that just in the way that the Trump administration conducted itself. Questions about the Article 5 commitment. And that gave Europeans pause to think maybe we're going to have to create an alternative to NATO if, if this trend continues. And that question is still out there. And President Biden has said as much, you know, if we pull out of Europe, what's going to happen? And Europeans are not going to necessarily be able to get their act together. And that's a huge risk for the United States. So I think the U.S. factor continues to be a major, you know, um, gorilla that you have to take account of somehow in doing these global assessments. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to go to questions from the audience and, and, the, and we have a couple about particular kinds of forecasts. One from Tony Singleton. Given the global rise of authoritarianism, has the US been influenced in that direction? Anyone? Um. 
Well, I think it's a reciprocal relationship that the rise of populism in Europe, in Russia, <clears throat> has certainly had echoes. And of course the internet has made it possible for these views to be spread rapidly. Um, so I think, yes, I think there is an interdependence and interrelationship between the rise of authoritarianism and the normalization in the US political uh, system for views that heretofore would have been would have been considered very authoritarian. Um, it's It has normalized, it's okay. I mean, Putin is okay if you believe some of the far right views in the United States. We should be doing more what he's doing. We should be do, doing more what she is doing, uh, more economic nationalism, if you will. And, you know, I think it's more of a desire for stability and predictability on the part of populations everywhere is that as they continue to be bombarded by waves of change and disruption, I mean, if you think about it, we went from a pandemic, which was something you'd read about in Nick, uh, you know, forecasts, uh, living through it, to uh, Putin making uh, nuclear threats that we haven't, you know, I've never really heard in my lifetime. I don't think we've ever heard nuclear threats like this. Uh, these are these are re really bombard people uh, with conceptual change with change in their lives they really reach down and touch people i think under those circumstances uh the the appeal of, of authoritarianism rises because it's really the a hearkening back to the past to a simpler era simple explanations simpler you know solutions uh you know yeah. looking for scapegoats right that's what it's all about anyone else okay um well my view my view as a student of american politics i i, I see this as more of something um, in, indigenous to the United States than being influenced by global forces, but but I think there is now some you know, you know some recipro some sense of reciprocal relationships going on going on here. Okay, on to another for forecast area. Should we concern should we concern about be concerned about an inevitable war between China and the United States? Although we although we we keep a strong you know dependence on each other. I don't believe in inevitability, but um, it sounds like John Mersheimer to me. Um, <laughs> if you look at a, you know, a simple factor, military forces rising, economic competition rising, inevitably there will be a clash because those national interests are just not um, possible to reconcile. Um, I don't believe it's inevitable. I think it could happen and under the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances. If you saw a declaration of independence by Taiwan, um, then I certainly think it's conceivable China would take military action. And then the question is, does the US respond to defend Taiwan? Um, but I don't think it's simply the matter that you have rising economic competition and rising military capability on the part of the Chinese that makes it inevitable. I think it will depend on specific circumstances where a core interest, in this case, Taiwan, could prompt China to do something that in turn would force the US to make a decision. I don't, I don't think there is some other inexorable you know, path to conflict. It does really raise the issue of another big issue about forecasting, which is analogies, right? It's, it's so easy for us. And mm -hmm. um, another question, um, are there other kinds of biases that should be highlighted besides the American bias uh, that should be taken into account for more precise um, intelligent, intelligence analyses and forecasting? Or, or is the American bias something that really extraordinarily stands out? Well, there's there are all kinds of biases that could affect intelligence and, and analysis. I mean, it's, I mean, it's long lists. I mean, when Jervis Jervis would work, he'd come up. You know, every header in the book was a different. You know, uh, too much certainty, too not enough attention to detail, too much attention to one. You know, it just would go on and on and on. The way these things combine is maddening. Um, uh, it's hard. I it, we can't explain why biases, uh, uh, anomalies. Uh, 
problems sort of all align in, in negative ways to hurt ana analysis and to hurt forecasts. So there are really scores of biases that can emerge. One could think of like the cry wolf syndrome. If you predict something and uh, the the uh, it doesn't come to pass, the policymakers won't listen to you, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think confirmation bias is very typical where you already have a hypothesis. I was going to know that, exactly. Time. You, you tend to look for evidence to support your hypothesis rather than look for disconfirming evidence. The yep. point was Iraq WMD, where we had a lot of old evidence that he liked to hide things and would do it again. And we didn't look for disconfirming information, even though there was some out there. Um, so I think confirmation bias is a very typical um, problem that analysts face with because you say, I need more information on this, assuming that that is the only answer you want. And then the collector will duly say, okay, we'll serve up some more because <laughs> they think they want more. You haven't asked them, well, is there any evidence to um, disconfirm this? And that, that's hard for analysts sometimes to think through. People also talk about a culture between analysts and policymakers, which defines the span of what's permissible, right? What's what's the issues of interest? What's the likely answers? And if if the forecast lies within that consensus, you do pretty well. But if it's outside the consensus, you don't do well. So, for example, in our paper, if a problem really would stem from American society that would 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 alter that future, it's unlikely that the Nick is going to say, "Hey." This person, administration, policy, you know, uh, a commercial enterprise is going to undermine or affect the future in this way. It's very unlikely. It's just not within the consensus to talk that way. I think political bias is always there too. That's a possibility. We haven't talked about politicization. I think in a case of a forecast looking 10 to 15 years out, there's less likely to be sensitivity around what the NIC says because it's well beyond the time frame for most politicians. Um, so if the Nick says that China is going to be number two, they're not going to take issue with that in 2008. It's like, okay, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. <laughs> but if, on the other hand, you say um, Saddam has no weapons of mass destruction and you're in the middle of a decision whether to invade or not, that would be a highly sensitive political issue of a uh, forecast. But I think global trends is not going to be prone to the political bias as much as some other documents might be within the intelligence community. I think that's right, though. The, the counterpart to that is uh, one of my colleagues at the Rand Corporation, our, the best strategic planner there, used to say about strategic planning, I think it's also true about thinking about the future, that if strategic planning doesn't affect what you do today, it's <laughs> only entertainment, right? <laughs> uh, and I think that uh, about futures as well. If futures doesn't have some bearing on what you're doing today. It probably is mostly entertainment. I like the entertainment, but it probably is mostly entertainment. So it does need to have some bite on how you think about policy issues today. Uh -huh. Well, the longer term perspective also allows you to think about little things you can be doing that can change that trajectory over the, the longer term. And it may not require as much lift on a, an issue if you've got 10 years to kind of make this happen yes. instead of 10 months. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a, I have a question about kind of issues, topics um, that there are either silence, si silence or silences on in, in, the, in, 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 in the report or there were th things in the report that you haven't discussed uh, more fully. One of which is, here's the question. How did the 2025 and the pre previous global trend studies do in estimating the potential for tightening of Russia-China strategic, a Russia-China strategic partnership that seems to be happening today? Um, as I recall, and this is again a 125-page document. Yeah, they mm. did talk in the document about the relationship between Russia and China. Um, but I think as a general rule, um, the Global Trends documents did not seem to believe that a formal axis of evil, <laughs> if I can use that term, would be possible because of the inherent 
competition between Russia and China, Russia's fear of a rising China um, and China is not wanting to tie itself too closely to Russia, given all the negatives that Putin was creating already in 2008, um, and that China wanted to be part of this international global trading system. So I think the document essentially was saying there are going to be limits on the amount of cooperation that China and Russia would achieve um, over the course of uh, it, 10, 15 years. It was more of a multipolar focus, more of a brick focus, sort of a loss of U.S. influence and a rise of sort of uh, competitors, but no, no competing alliance. Yeah. I think that's been a sort of pretty consistent theme in, in Nick writings throughout. And I think Roger's got it right that the, as uh, China and Russia work together, scratch each other's back, that's going to stay short of a strategic alliance for a couple of reasons. Well, the one most obvious is probably that in any strategic alliance, Russia would be the junior partner. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem any part of Vladimir Putin's ambitions for Russia. And if you think about the current circumstance, this has got to be very uncomfortable for China. Here we have their friend Russia trampling on everything the Chinese Communist Party has held dear for 50 years. Sovereignty, non-interference, all of those things. And even worse, there's the world has created a kind of symmetry between Taiwan and Ukraine, which has got to be very uncomfortable for China since whatever else we think, China's claim to Taiwan is a lot stronger than any claim by Russia to Ukraine. So in that sense, I think that really we're seeing play out the uh, visible manifestations of the uh, difficulties of any real strategic link between China and Russia. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we, we just have one more question. There's one more question we have time for, and it's an interesting one. Um, how does forecasting, by taking a view of the future, influence our perception of the fu future and shape our actions? Well, I, th I think if you were talk to a scenarioist like a Peter Schwartz, who started it with Roy right. decades ago, what he was trying to do was to present to a policymaker, decision maker in industry or in government, an expanded view of multiple futures and so that a policymaker could keep those in the back of his or her mind while making day-to-day deci -day decisions, because uh, as we talked about earlier, decisions you make today may well limit or expand your options over time. Um, I mean, the, the work that was done on fracking, for example, uh, may have seemed pretty inconsequential, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, and then boom, it became economically advantageous to use fracking because of technology's advance. So I think the idea that these forecasts can be useful as a way to give the policymaker a better feel for the uncertainties of the world and how he or she can help shape those by the decisions he's making or she's making today is a useful contribution. And, and it's certainly not a prediction. None of us is saying, we know exactly what's gonna happen in 2025 and it's already too late. You can't shape anything about it. Just, you know, duck and cover. Um, that would be pretty uh, disconcerting uh, if we were doing that kind of work. Instead, we have to talk about just how unknown the future is and how much opportunity there may be out there for each of us to shape that future. And you know, Roger, I think you mentioned the, the, the point earlier that you know, if a little bit of action in advance can maybe alter that and make things better. You know, if you looked at those pandemic predictions and said, well, okay, there's gonna be a viral pandemic, airborne, whatever. How well prepared are we for this? How exactly. are we making any advances? Is the, are we getting better at it? Are we moving closer or getting better? Is it getting worse? If for a policymaker, you know, there's one longstanding uh, forecast that's in, I think the Nick, Nick for the last at least 10, 15 years, is that global population will begin to shrink between 2040 and 2050, right? Those not, it's slowing, it, it could reverse. What does that mean for policymakers? What should they begin to think about? Um, uh, you know, what does that mean for global warming? 
right? The, the, those causing the warming, there are going to be fewer of them around. What does this all mean for us? That would be something that you could begin to act on now because 2040 might seem a long time away, but maybe it's not so far, right? It's closer well, than it's, you think. Go ahead. I was going to say, I agree. The, the key is really asking systematically, if I take this vision of the future seriously, should I be doing something different now? In your example, the pandemic is exactly right. If you took that seriously, we should have done a lot better, a lot more by way of preparation for it uh, long ago, not uh, not be caught by surprise as we were when it happened. Mm. Yeah. But the irony is, is how much better are we, you know, if, given the Nick forecasts uh, and, and a lot of the data involved in this, this the, the COVID-19 was just, it was, was not a real pandemic. It was barely uh, in the in serious incident range, right? I mean, the real pandemic has not really hit us yet where you're getting, you know, you know, you get lethality at about 50% from whatever disease is contracted. So are we, we still have a long way to go to prepare for the main event, which is somewhere in our, still in our future. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, th I think you've, I think you've, you've concluded here with uh, justification for this, this kind of enterprise yes. and exercise. And I want to thank you all for, uh, for doing this. I want to thank the audience for joining us at this Academy Forum. We hope to see you at our next Academy Forum, forum in the next quarter. And I want to thank uh, Jim, Roger, and, and Greg for participating. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.